morning, Friday morning, 10 o'clock. I wanted to spend this time to clarify some things about last week's video. It's my crazy cat. Uh, so, last week was talking about dissolving our allegiance to the ego mind, and that's maybe one step after learning the basics. So I'm going to go over that again. What the ego mind is, how it functions, and some choices of how we can manage or uh, deal with how it functions. So I think that we can agree, right? We can agree that our minds are constantly talking to us all the time. That's what they're made to do, really. And so I distinguish the difference between great mind and ego mind. And ego mind is what I said earlier. It's the thing that's talking to us the day to day. And uh, it's helping us with the, 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 the meat of living, not the, the great epiphanies. Um, and unfortunately, just like you can overbuild muscles in your body, which can affect your alignment or your state of health, you can overbuild your mind muscle. And I think, I believe that most of us have done this. We've overbuilt our ego minds because we rely on them so heavily. So what this looks like is chatter, chatter, chatter which comes in all forms. And the interesting thing is, you may notice that the ego mind never has things to say in the positive. It only has things to say in the negative. I'm not saying that it's um, always being uh, mean. It's not always mean, but it's always negating. That's how, that's how it lives, that's how it decides what it's not. So for example, you're on the street and um, your ego mind is scanning, sort of like I imagine like the Terminator um, eyes, remember Terminator? Scanning all the people on the street and it's saying I'm not that, and I'm not that, and I'm not that. And it can either be I'm not that, I want to be that, or I'm not that, and I definitely have to make sure that I'm not that. I'm, I'm not you, and I'm not you, and I'm not you, and I'm not you. And it's either causing us uh, feelings of desire and lust and um, ache, or it's causing us uh, feelings of fear and shutting down and closing in and um, distaste. So that's what the ego mind does. So, um, there, there we go. There's our ego mind. That's what it's doing. It functions as um, a way to make decisions by negating. And we've overbuilt this. We've overbuilt this because somewhere, and I'm not really sure where, I'd have to do more studying on it. Um, I'd have to be an anthropologist. But somewhere we learned that through this series of negations that we would find what is real, what is true for us. So we listen to it. We really are listening to every single thing that our ego minds are saying because we're looking for our kernels of truth. Okay, so this is what I was talking about last week. I was talking about dissolving that allegiance to listening to it. And this is where I think a lot of people get fuzzy on the idea. Because when you think of meditation, when you think of liberating yourself from ego and words like that, it's, there's a lot of buzzwords, um, you think, I need to be quiet. You think silence. You think that Buddhas have nothing going on inside them. It's just a still lake, right? Just complete and utter um, zero emptiness or complete fullness. There's no quakes, which I don't believe to be true. This is where we get messed up. It's not that we need to obliterate our ego minds in order to be free. 
Um, and I say that mostly just because I don't think it's the easiest way to be silent and happy and in harmony. And the two great uh, ways of describing how to agitate the ego mind is one, if you're an insomniac or you deal with um, you know, sleeplessness, you know, you know inside yourself that telling yourself to go to sleep is about the worst thing you can do to try to get yourself to get to sleep. It just uh, activates shame and anger and the brain in total and you're awake. So the more you yell at yourself to go to sleep, the more you don't sleep. And the other um, example that really illuminates this is if you are a parent. And I've been experiencing this um, for the past year because I'm a teacher. Sometimes with a child, the more you engage with him or her, the more you fall into the rabbit hole of illogic and um, suffering. So what it looks like is your child wants the ice cream from the ice cream truck, and the first thing you try is to reason. I can't get you that ice cream because you've already had a bunch of sugar today and it's not good for your levels and you're not going to feel well afterwards. So actually I'm trying to save you the burden of a tummy ache by not allowing you to have that ice cream. And what happens is uh, the kid has a tantrum, right? And the more you try to get a level of understanding between you two, the more it seems that there's a gap between you. I sort of love that about children, actually. Um, so it doesn't work. It doesn't work to try to understand each other sometimes. It doesn't work to tell yourself to go to sleep. It just only agitates the ego mind more. So what I'm saying is the ideal that happy people have no ego mind may not necessarily be true and the attempt to do that doesn't seem to be very effective at all, just to obliterate the ego mind. So when I say dissolve the allegiance, I don't mean dissolve the ego mind. I don't mean get into this altered state where you're not talking to yourself anymore. I'm not sure how many people have done that, where they're just walking around and having no chatter whatsoever. Um, a more effective way to find a sense of openness. I talk about that a lot, of openness and breath and uh, stability is not to try to squelch the ego mind, not to ignore it, not to push it away and deny it. Denial seems to just create more friction. What, um, what you could do is start actually paying attention Pay attention to it. Go ahead and give that ego child, give that insomniac some love and, and give it your gaze and pay attention to what it's saying. And when you do that, when you pay attention to what it's saying... Hey, so I uh, lost my other footage. What I was saying is when you pay attention, when you give a compassionate attention to your ego mind and you're really listening to it, not uh, blindly following it, but actually opening yourself to listen to it. What you realize is that it contradicts each itself all the time. That's all it does is contradict itself because it's in a constant state of wanting and a constant state of trying to get you to move. So when you do what it says, it'll say the opposite just to keep you moving. An example of this is going back to the child with the, with the ice cream. The child wants the ice cream so much, it gives you reason A, B, and C the, why it should have the ice cream. And then once you have debuffed the A, B, and C, then it'll give you an entirely different A, B, and C. Totally from another angle. Probably against what it said earlier. And the ego mind does this too because its whole um, function is to is to get you to move. That's that's what it does to get you to think, to get you to uh, think critically and to categorize, which is to 
keep you in a state of um, thinking, keep you in a state of believing that there's more to be done. So what I want you to do, and earlier I said uh, our allegiance is listening, but really our allegiance is believing. So what I want, <laughs> it's my ego mind saying that, or what I'm trying to say here is listen compassionately and then come to your own conclusions if you want to be listening to a voice like that. If you believe that a voice that contradicts itself that many times to get you to move is something that's telling you the truth. And when you decide that it's not telling the truth, if you do, when you decide that it's not lucrative or effective for you, then what happens is complete openness, complete possibility. Because when you believe in everything your ego mind says, you are running around corners and corners and corners and never getting anywhere. An example of this is uh, your ego mind says you have to go to school or you have to make a lot of money to support your family and to do that. You have to have all these credentials. You have to do great at your job. You have to work harder so you're noticed. And that way you will have stability to um, support yourself and have security. And then as soon as you reach a goal of feeling secure, then your ego mind tells you, what have you done? You've wasted your life from this nine to five and you haven't tasted life at all. So when you don't believe everything it says, it can be chatting to you and you don't believe it. You can even be listening to it with a compassionate ear. Then you can just rest and you can decide to make meaning in other ways. And we could talk about that next week. But first I would like you to feel what it feels like to not be run ragged by believing in your ego mind and doing everything that it says and allowing it to talk to you and you don't have to do anything about it. And one of the things that can come from this, that can ar arise from this restful state is um, a feeling of worthiness, of being worthy of happiness that it can well up, it can flow into you instead of you having to go out and chase it. When you are in this place of not running, what you realize is that happiness is available to you without you having to exert yourself so much, without exhaustion. So the difference between obliterating or denying the ego mind and dissolving our allegiance is this simple um, idea that because you have an ego mind you are not wrong because you have an ego mind you are not sick it's not wrong to have one it's it's a human being thing to have one it's there for a reason and it does help you make day-to-day -day decisions but you don't need to fundamentally believe in it that it is the source of truth. So the difference is not ignoring, not denying because you think it's bad, but realizing its nature and loving it for what it is and letting go of the rest. <laughs>